Hello again, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for coming back. Um, it's great to see um, you all here. So, um, you know who I am? I'm Razia Iqbal, and I'm delighted to be joined on the stage uh, by uh, Jody Ruderen. Rudoran. Excellent. We've had the conversation three times about pronouncing her name. That's shameful. <laughs> um, from who is the associate managing editor of the New York Times, and next to her is Thalat Yakoub, who is the co-founder of uh, Equate Scotland and Fifty Fifty, and next to her is uh, Médecins Sans Frontières' first female boat captain, Madeline Habib. Um, but as is. <laughs> As is the case with um, many women and many people generally, uh, they are more than the titles that I've just given them, obviously. Uh, we are here to talk about, uh, this, this session is called 100 Years On, uh, because 2018 is 100 years since uh, women uh, over the age of 20, one, I think it is, got the vote um, in the UK. Uh, so we are going to be talking about uh, the ongoing fight to uh, for women's voices to be heard. That's what this session says, but we're going to talk about what these remarkable women do. And uh, we're going to start with Jody because the Me Too movement, um, Jody, began when uh, two of your colleagues in the New York Times, uh, Jody Cantor and uh, Megan tu Tui um, wrote and exposed fantastic piece of journalism for which they won the Pulitzer Prize. Um, the ongoing, I think, three decades worth of uh, sexual abuse and harassment uh, perpetrated by the Hollywood producer Harvey Weinstein. Um, talk us through a little how long that investigation took, because this was obviously something that had been going on for some time. Yeah, thank you, Razia, and thanks, Mark, and everybody for having us here and for, for bringing this, for adding this session to the conversation, which I think is so important, especially in this moment. We're coming up uh, in October on a year since the Harvey Weinstein story was published, and I think, you know, we're really just still seeing every week uh, new reverberations of what some people call the Me Too moment or the Me Too movement. Um, Jody and Megan spent, I think, about six months uh, investigating for that story. And also, uh, the Pulitzer that we won, that we shared with The New Yorker for public service, was not just about the Harvey Weinstein story. It was also about the Bill O'Reilly investigation, which was more than a year and a half of work by two other colleagues. Um, it was the investigation that, that Kim Severson did of Mario Batalia and the Spotted Pig. Um, and and uh, there was colleagues, other colleagues who investigated um, sexual harassment and abuse at the Ford plant. I think what's really interesting, looking back, as again, as we come up to the years, sort of, so what is it about these stories that, made this time different um, than so many other times that sexual harassment scandals have kind of appeared and gone away. I mean, some of you remember Anita Hill, and in the year after Anita Hill, um, sexual harassment complaints in our country. Uh, I we think, should remind people who Anita Hill Sorry, is, Anita so. Hill was the law professor who testified about Clarence Thomas having sexually harassed her. Um, at the Clarence e Thomas was at the Supreme Court at the time? It was, this was, he was nominated for the Supreme Court. This came out in her, his Senate confirmation hearings. Um, the great irony was that the sexual harassment occurred at our um, when they both worked at the Equal Opportunity Employment Commission, which is <laughs> where you file your complaints about sexual harassment. And they indeed uh, doubled over the next year, but then people forgot uh, who she was. And I think we spent a lot of time trying to understand what it was about this round of stories and this moment. And I think there were a few really important things to keep in mind. I mean, the first one really is about investigative journalism and is about the fact that almost all of the accusers were on the record and named and corroborated. Every every accuser, every accusation had, had three uh, contemporaneous witnesses sort of in the stories. And we kept that up through all of our investigative reporting against all the various targets. The second thing I think is that the, um, in this case, the accusers were better known and better loved and in some cases sexier and more beautiful, uh, Gwyneth Paltrow and Ashley Judd and Salma Hayek, uh, than the accused, uh, which is the sort of reverse of, let's say, Bill Clinton and Paula Jones. Um, and the third thing, of, it's sort of the answer to everything these days, right, which is the power of social media. And what happened after these very prominent women went on the record with their names to make these accusations, and by the way, you know, everybody in Hollywood had known about these accusations for a very long time, and other journalists had tried to do the story. But we saw this outpouring on Facebook and Twitter and other places, and 
and in real life, really, where people stood up and put their face and their name to their own stories. And that's, of course, how we got the phrase Me Too, although it was invented earlier. Um, and I think that there's, you know, again, it's been a really profound year. I mean, it's still happening, right? Last week with Asia Argento and other stories. So it's really interesting to think 100 years on what the next 100 years might look like and maybe the Me Too generation. Well, well let me ask you, first of all, then, just before I move to Thalat and, um, and Madeline, just to respond to, to, to how much of a change was made by that story. Richard, um, is it Rich? Rich Lowry, editor of the National Review, said that... This investigation by, by Jody and Megan was the single most influential piece of journalism I can remember. It instantly changed this country. Do you think that's true? I definitely, I, first of all, I don't think it's only our country. I mean, I do think that this has reverberated around the world. But I think the change, you know, change is a great word because it encompasses so much. I think there's a lot of forward and back and sideways going on. Um, clearly, there has never been as much direct fallout uh, in terms of you know powerful men losing their jobs when um, women uh, and other people make accusations, and we continue to see that uh, with you know whether it be Larry Nasser or uh, as I said Mario Batali or, or you know many other that we have a ongo we stopped doing it keeping up to date, but the graphic we had had I think seventy five people who had been felled from their jobs. Mm -hmm. I think though the real change that is affecting most people in our country, and I imagine also here is not when a famous powerful person gets fired from their job but when everybody's workplace either changes or doesn't or starts and i know in our workplace in our newsroom over the last year we've had conversations completely unprecedented conversations about how people talk to each other about how meetings are run about how stories are assigned about you know representation um, uh, in our in our work those conversations have never happened in this kind of way before, uh, particularly not with, I think, a presumption of, of, you know, with women not having as much of a burden of proof to kind of say, you know, men and women leaders in our newsroom are thinking about the tenor of, of our meetings and whether they're male dominated or not. And that is, that's the first time that's happened in our newsroom. I think it's happening in workplaces around the world. And I think that's changed that, I don't know, I don't, you know, when we come back 110 years on, will it look like progress? I don't know, but I think change for sure. Yeah, so there's been a huge shift. Uh, Talat Yacoub, do you recognize that change as manifest in the work that you do? Because you're involved in, in not just trying to equalize representation in parliament, but you're also involved in uh, trying to encourage and make possible for young women to, to be represented in mm -hmm. science, technology, and so on. So how much of a difference or an impact did what Jody's talking about make in the area that you're working in? I think the impact has actually been on women feeling able to talk about the experiences that they've had. That space to be able to actually say, well, hold on, other people have experienced this. And I feel like there is that courage, and it doesn't matter what part of the globe it's come from, that courage to be able to talk about it. And that's why it's um, been reflected in Westminster and, and Hollywood as well. It's and not they had something... been silent before? And I think a lot of them felt that they had to be silent or there was no space for this conversation. But just as, as was said there, it's... It's the conversations that are happening. I don't think the action has, has yet happened. These things take a long time. We're looking for societal culture change. Um, as much as I would like to say it would happen overnight, it's, it, it won't. But the conversations, and particularly women feeling able to have those conversations, more women feeling able to report what they're experiencing, is definitely a shift that I've seen. Um, and we've, we've seen it in, for example, the Scottish Parliament pursuing a, um, a survey and an investigation to find out what is the culture like within the Scottish Parliament would not have happened had this conversation not have begun. And it doesn't, again, it doesn't matter what side of the, of the ocean that happened on, but it created a, a ripple effect that meant that people were coming forward who were working in the civil service or were women who were candidates, political party candidates, or were women who were politicians coming forward and talking about their experiences and, and 
it created a space where the Scottish Parliament felt the need to investigate and find out, um, in which one in five women who responded said, yes, this is something I've experienced. And that in itself, that information is necessary to create any kind of change. Madeline, the, the charity sector has been rocked by this too. I mean, we've had the scandal inside Save the Children and Oxfam and so on. I mean, the, in the context in which this is happening, how, how shocked were you that that was being exposed? Well, first of all, thank you for welcoming me here at Beyond Borders, my first time here. Um, I wasn't shocked. And I think as a member of society and as a woman, you can't be shocked by it in any sector. And I think we should actually feel a little bit sad and embarrassed that 100 years on, we're sitting here on this stage having this conversation yeah. and talking about women as if we're a minority because we're not, we actually make up a majority. There are more of us than there are of men. So why do we feel underrepresented? And, and why are we underrepresented? And why are we abused and why don't we have a voice? I really think that the fact that we still have to have conversations about it rather than clear-cut action mm -hmm. and that we are not considered absolutely equal, it's a, a sad situation to be in. I don't feel that this is a celebratory moment, that the Me Too moment should never have had to happen because we should have passed that 100 years ago when we got the vote. But that's clearly not the case. <laughs> um, and I, you know, I, I wonder when you, when you say it's not a celebratory moment, and of course it, it isn't when you think about the pain mm -hmm. that is behind um, all these revelations, what, what is it that you would like to see now that doesn't exist and how far are we from achieving it? I, I feel a little bit disempowered when I hear about more studies and I feel like we already know so let's take action and let's work together and recognize our capabilities and seize opportunities. And women also need to change the way that they project themselves. And we need to see ourselves and, and put ourselves on the world stage because right now we do have the support. And so we need to stand up and seize this opportunity. It's, it's time to shine. So. Well, let's. I, I, I want to. I want to talk about when you talk about we have the support because there's clearly been a backlash, and the backlash mm -hmm. will come again and again and again. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But but let's talk about the shining first. <laughs> um, so so t tell us uh, tell us a little more about being MSF's first female um, captain. I, I, I want to hear the stories of of the flotilla that you led to Gaza. Just give us some background and just tell us about that experience. Well, MSF doesn't have much experience with ships, so to be the first female captain wasn't such a big deal. <laughs> but everyone cheered. They all loved it. <laughs> but to be, to be a woman and to be a captain is, uh, it does put me in a very small figure. Two, the maritime industry has 2% representation by women, and 90% of that 2% work in the hotel industry on board cruise ships. So it's a very rare thing to have a female captain, and that's absurd, because any woman could drive a ship. I mean, you just go to maritime college and pass the exams and get the experience. We're all capable of it. And yet it's very difficult for a woman who even does achieve the qualification to get on board the ships. So I think that there does need to be some kind of support mechanism amongst women, and we do need to promote and support each other. But I do feel like it's not a moment to rest on our laurels and say, well, the Me Too movement has done this thing. We need to stand up and act. It's, it's not a time for more studies. And in the regard of the flotilla, um, in 2016, I was the captain of a sailing boat to Gaza with 13 women on board, 13 women in a very small boat with four double bunks. We had a Nobel Peace Prize winner on board, um, Mairead Maguire from Ireland. And we had an ex-US general, Anne Wright, on board, so two women over the age of 70, and a revolving cast of characters as we sailed across the Mediterranean, but all women. And in the history of the Freedom Flotilla, it has been a violent history. Ten people lost their lives in 2010 when they were killed by Israeli Defence Forces doing the same activity as we were doing. But which was what? You were breaking the blockade? Breaking the blockade of Gaza, exactly. And I think what was different in the year 
when I went and when it was all women on board was that we did manage to present it in an entirely peaceful and conciliatory manner and we did actually manage to engage in conversation with the Israeli Defence Force and I feel like if we want to present a peaceful solution we need to be able to engage peacefully and I really hope that one day there will be peaceful dialogue instead of um, you know, shelling and mortars and rocks and bombs going over the border between Gaza and Israel because quite clearly that is not a way forward. So when, when you when uh, tell us when you hear Madeline talking about this not being a celebratory moment, and uh, you yeah. know you're you're definitely a generation younger than than Jody for sure, and a <laughs> generation and a half. No, a generation and a half younger than me is what it's, I mean. It's just it's just really good moisturiser. Yeah, uh, <laughs> don't be so ridiculous. Um, and that wasn't meant to be. I was talking about me being older than you, yes, by the I'm way. Sure you were. Because you didn't let me finish. Definitely. Come on. Um, and I wonder to what extent you are encouraged by what Madeline has just said, or, or to what extent you feel despondent. I don't think I. I would never. I've been working in tackling sexism, gender equality for the last ten years, and I don't think in that time I would refer to me to as a celebratory move, moment, I don't think I would. I think what it was, was a, mom, a moment that created a ripple effect and one would hope is used to create change and instigate change. I don't see any kind of celebration within it. I hope that women feel able to more report. I think it created some global sisterhood. It felt like that. It felt like women were able to talk to one another. That is something to celebrate because women coming together and being able to speak about something that has might have felt just unspeakable until now, that is something that is crucial. Nothing, none of it is a celebration because I, it is 2018 and the fact that these conversations are still going on and there is little generational change is, is depressing, it's, it's exhausting. I don't, I, my ideal is to do myself out of a job. I don't want to be doing this. That's, that's the reality. At some point, I'd like a career change because gender equality wasn't a thing. That's, yes. that's, that's the ideal, right? But wouldn't that be nice? That would be wonderful. But progress is, is too slow. And whilst um, what these moments do is create a little bit of fire and a little bit of change and a push, particularly for those people like me who are pushing and it's up a hill and getting global conversations about it is, is hugely important. And the way in which that had an effect upon my everyday work was impactful mm. because the conversations were happening. I am able to have a conversation with employers who are in the tech industry and are not interested in gender equality unless it's about the bottom line. Mm. Suddenly, I wasn't knocking on the door as much as they were knocking on mine. That is a shift that I think is good, not good enough, because I'm not interested in a tick box because you feel you better do something before some negative story about your company comes <laughs> out. But the minute you knock on the door, I'm going to barge my way in and do something about it, right? So if it's doing that, then I'm grateful to it. OK, so, so a, a, a slight shift, which means that nobody wants to be caught out in the, the kind of cultural change that we are beginning to see. But alongside that, there's been a real backlash yeah. uh, with not least on you know social media platforms, which is where it's easy to be anonymous and fight. Um, I. I'd like to hear from each of you any particular experiences that you've had of of, of the backlash. Let's start with you, Thalit. Well, the, the, on social media, being a feminist and a woman of colour on social media, every day is a backlash. <laughs> like this, I mean, honestly, that's the way it felt. I, I had the audacity of, of um, responding to Boris Johnson's comments on the burqa a little while ago. And I mean, it took, and I, and I wrote a comment piece about it, and it took um, a couple of, I mean, never read below the line in a newspaper, I should know this by now. However, the com it took a, a couple of comments down before somebody questioned, well, yours is a foreign sounding name, what are you doing talking about British politics? That Okay, so, so racism, sexism, Islamophobia is, is real, it's alive, it exists mm. in Scotland, it exists everywhere. Um, but it's, it's um, and we can see that actually in some of the instances in, in Hollywood, particularly when it has been somebody prominent, um, and some of that is very live at the moment, so I'm not going to be discussing that, but um, when somebody is accused of something, how quickly the comments are about witch hunts. 
And if anybody starts a, a tweet or an article with witch hunt, I switch off because it's nonsense and I'm not interested in listening to their opinion. But it's, it's that the, the, it's a witch hunt, it's gone too far, men are too scared to even flirt anymore. I mean, I don't even know what that means. <laughs> Um, and but but counter to that is the letter that uh, a lot of French women wrote in mm -hmm. Le Monde in the immediate aftermath yeah. of the movement starting, yes. in which they talked about you know including Catherine Deneuve amongst I can't think of any of the other big names but there were lots of big names, uh, in which they talked about how this was counter to French culture and the relationships between men and women. So, you know, this is a complicated yeah. area. There, it isn't a question yeah. of a binary uh, being on the one side or yeah. the other. I mean, I think there's also no doubt that there were men who were fired without proper investigation into their behavior. I mean, there's no question that there are cases of, you know, people just being kneecapped uh, without due diligence in the, in the kind of immediate aftermath of this. And that I think that doesn't, you know, do anybody any good. And there also was, I mean, you know, this idea, this embracing of the Mike Pence rule, which I imagine maybe hasn't penetrated over here, but this is oh, the tell idea us. Do tell us. that, uh, I mean, Mike Pence said this for religious reasons, but then after Me Too, it became adopted for other reasons. Mike Pence said he does not uh, take one-on-one -on -one meetings with women because he's a Christian, he shouldn't be alone with any woman other than his wife, which is fine, except that then you can't have like a chief of staff who's a woman. And so there was a lot of talk after, uh, you know, last November and December about should men in offices mentor women? And if, if not, that, you know, given how many men are more senior in workplaces, and again, this is to me how the thing plays out. I mean, I very clearly remember my first job Lo those many years ago, Razia. <laughs> I am never going to we be were, forgiven for we this. We were writing news stories on tablets with chisels and... Um, no. Um, Maya Culpa, come on, give me um, a My break. best friends, I was, I was uh, 21, um, just out of school. I was an intern and got hired at the Los Angeles Times, and I, my two best friends there were, or three really, were these guys who were about 10 years older than me. And we had lunch every day, and they, they were kind of my work spouses types, and you know, they were really great to me. Anyway, Marty Barron, who now is the editor of the Washington Post, and who I'm sure you've heard speak, became the editor of where we were working. And it's such a bizarre story, but anyway, there was this long hallway in our office from the loo, I'll try to be uh, British for you, <laughs> to where we, you have to walk down it. Anyway, I kind of noticed that I was constantly seeing these two guys who I was friends with walking back from the bathroom with Marty and having these like chummy conversations, which I had no access to because I wasn't in the bathroom with Marty. And I mean, I didn't really want to go to the bathroom with Marty either. Um, and I later <laughs> ran into Jill Abramson, the first female editor of the New York Times in the bathroom, and that's a whole nother story. But anyway, I just realized that was a really important like power structure thing for me. Um, it's also why I became very passionate about gender neutral bathrooms. <laughs> another story entirely. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. I do think, you know, we do not want to work in a workplace where men don't want to mentor women or be in one-on-one -on -one meetings with women or are so worried about their interactions with women that they don't, you know, that is not a good thing for women. So. Um, yeah, gender neutral bathrooms. <laughs> anyway. You were going to say something. Yeah, I, that, that's not, I, I, I absolutely agree. And I think um, the, the way in which that's come out in this kind of men are scared of, of what to do or, or soon men won't be able to do anything at all. I, I don't think the line is that fine between sexual harassment and competent working with another woman. Mm -hmm. Like, I just don't think, like, it's pretty damn clear. <laughs> right. And if it's a blur to you, then the problem's you. Yeah. I, I don't really know how else to put it. And so I, when I read this, you know, soon men won't be able to do X as a consequence of this. Well, men probably weren't, shouldn't have been doing X. That's probably why. So when I do hear this, I'm not really interested in the... I feel like it's uh, trying to make it OK, trying to dilute the cause, the issue. And it doesn't... It, I, I, I kind of... I, of course, completely aside, yeah. agree with you, yeah, and yeah. it is not my responsibility yeah, to yeah. stop you know, men yeah. from yeah. touching other women's boobs or something. But I just think that, um, but when you talk about backlash and about yeah. the ability to do the work you want to do, I do think there's a risk that the conversation becomes, you know, the, the world 
that, sorry, Madeline, but the world does continue to be controlled by men, mm -hmm. by and large, mm -hmm. parliaments, workplaces, et cetera. And so I do think we have to be watchful of how that conversation mm -hmm. plays out for the actual women who are actually trying to work. Mm -hmm. But isn't it interesting that the whole Me Too movement ca came out at a time when the President of the United States won on a campaign during which he, you know, the videotape that was released or the audio tape of him saying that, you know, you can grab women by the pussy, et cetera, et cetera. Nothing happened to his ratings as a result of that revelation. Yeah. At, you know, that the, the, there is at one level a kind of emboldening and a permission being given to men who may agree with that kind of attitude and behavior. And, and yet there is this kind of cultural shift going on as well. I mean, I'm, I'm interested in the fact that these two things are happening at the same time. I'm Madeline? interested in the way that Trump manages to get mentioned in every single <laughs> <laughs> talk today. It's, so I was hoping to get through this one without his name being mentioned. I'm sorry, it's That's very hard. Yes. I mean, you know, if, if you have someone in that office that, ha you know, he wields a huge amount of power and has shifted so much. So I forgot to say that it's actually the other, I think, factor in mm. what was different here than in the prior generations of, of sexual harassment scandals in our country. Um, and uh, my colleague, Jessica Bennett, wrote a story maybe six weeks into, or maybe four weeks, um, that really looked at this and, and had a, a great sort of an analytical take on it. And it really talked about how, for both Trump supporters and Trump critics, that very fact affected their reaction to the Weinstein story. Mm -hmm. That obviously Trump critics uh, or the resistance, as they call mm -hmm. themselves, um, you know, really were so riled up from Access Hollywood and from the idea that a misogynist could get elected despite that tape, they were very ready to jump on this. Um, and, you know, if, if we can't keep him from the White House, we'll at least, you know, knock out Harvey Weinstein and, and his like. And I think there were also, I mean, many, many Trump supporters did not, you know, support vote for him because they like misogynists. They voted for him in spite of the Access Hollywood tape because they supported his economic policies or his immigration policies or whatever. And I think for many of those Republican suburban women who voted for him in very large numbers, um, it felt like, OK, this is my chance to sort of react to the, you know, an election is a very, very complicated decision. And most people make it based on how they feel about their pocketbook in the weeks before. Mm -hmm. And so I think people weren't willing to change their full political vote for president um, over this one revelation. But then a few weeks later, they felt, or a year later, whatever, they felt. Yeah. Um, Which is unusual in the history of campaigning, that it didn't make the kind of impact that people expected it to. I think. But anyway, that's another story. Madeline, I, w I want to just explore this point that you've made, which is that, you know, we, n we need to just act. Hmm. Uh, I, how, how does that look for you? What does that look like? Well, the step between thought and action is always a very difficult one. And it, even if you do feel empowered and supported, it is really difficult to act upon that. But as Western women in particular, we are in a rather gifted situation. And so we need to start seeing opportunities rather than obstacles, take on challenges, know that other people have your back, that there are support mechanisms out there, and to take on those challenging roles. And um, I just feel like we have to seize the moment and not hide behind the idea that we're not capable or that we will be taken down and ride the wave. But we are still talking about structures and systems that, you know, you mentioned, Talat, that, you know, that the intersectional stuff is really interesting. Mm -hmm. So if you're a woman of colour, that there are, you know, there's yet another set of obstacles that, that you have to, yeah, I, think, you encounter and you have to try and, and, and get over. I, I remember joining a ship one time and a couple of days into it, one of the guys said to me, he said, look, you're a woman, you're a greenie and you're an Arab. What is there to like about you? And I thought, oh, I'm really up against it here. But, you know, we, we did get past that. And he did learn to see me as an equal and a co-worker and everything. But, yeah, OK, so you, you do face these, these challenges. But it doesn't mean that they're not worth facing. And really, if we can't do it now, 100 years on, then we may as well just all go back to the kitchen. 
you know, I'm, I'm not willing to. So I really hope that, I really do, but I really do hope that I can inspire and mentor young women at sea and encourage women to, to take on roles in what I don't call them male dominated fields, I call them historically male dominated fields because those days are over and we do have the right to take on any roles that we want. All those, you know, I also would like to say thank you to all the men for all those years who tend to work in things like sanitation engineering and those kind of things because they are also male dominated roles that we've always been quite happy not to be part of and if we want equality we have to be equal <laughs> really and not just take the jobs that look nice yeah yeah yeah, yeah. I, i've got more questions but i'm going to open it up to the floor um and her hand's gone up there straight away and just wait for the microphone if you wouldn't mind Thank you very much. So um, I, I work in surgery where 12% of consultant surgeons are women, so we're positively plentiful compared to the uh, maritime industry. My question really is around how, how can we inspire young women to develop the resilience and the courage to follow their passions? Because I speak to a lot of undergraduate medical students who are saying, look, this all just seems too hard from where I'm sitting. And uh, how do we work with, with young people to, to really allow them to, to follow their dreams, if you like? Talat Yacoub, this one's for you, I feel. OK. <laughs> um, I have the privilege of working with a lot of young women who are coming through and studying science, technology, engineering, mathematics. And at the moment in Scotland, um, I'm going to throw statistics at you because this is it's just drilled into my head, so I can't help myself. Um, but uh, after qualifying, uh, around 73% of women who have qualified at an undergraduate level will not stay in science, technology, engineering, mathematics past middle management. So there's a huge drop, a loss of talent, loss of ambition. And uh, what, what women tell us is that's about um, a lack of flexible working. It's about the, the roles in the workplace and home not being equal. Um, and the fact that we've really got to tackle both those things if we're going to get anywhere. And it's about sexism in the workplace and that constantly having to fight that, constantly having to um, kind of def assert your existence. Is, is exhausting. Um, but what I what I do find is that the women who are more of the younger women who are coming in are refusing to accept it. And there is a kind of refusal of, well, I, I don't expect this from the workplace by now. And so there's more of an almost like an, an anger into action, which I think is a, is a wonderful thing. In terms of what we can do, I think um, I think creating uh, networks for women to develop and not being shy about doing things that are women only. I know that sometimes leaves a, an aftertaste in some people's mouths, but it needs done. It needs done. We need to have safe spaces for women to develop, and I endorse that. And at the same time, um, supporting uh, all students, whether they are men or women or non-binary, whatever it might be, um, to then engage in gender equality and equality diversity work. One of the things that we do in the organisation that I, I, I run is um, equality and diversity training for all engineering students or all science and technology students because they are going to be the managers of tomorrow and the men need to be good managers and be the ones that want to tackle the structures and the sexism and not recruit like for like. So I think there's things we can do that are women-only spaces and developing and supporting resilience training and confidence building but also the men that are going to be the managers of tomorrow have to be involved in that conversation too. I wonder if it's also about just making sure that women have facts at their disposal. I mean, I, I work routinely with women who are at the BBC who are 20 years younger than I am. And I had a conversation with a couple of them recently who said, uh, when I talked about being a feminist, they said, but, but we're, we're fine, we're equal. And I said, so the man who sits opposite you and the man who sits next to you, do you know whether you earn exactly the same? You do the same job, you're both producers. And at that moment, they both looked at me and said, well, I don't know. And I said, well, if, until you know, you're not going to know whether the, the statement that you've just made about being equal is factually accurate or not. And so in a way, transparency about these things is, is a really important part yeah. of it as well. Uh, more questions? the lady in the front and then there was a hand that went up there thank you 
Hello, I'm from Myanmar. So we are also doing Me Too movement in our country. So now it is became very active and some of the young women who are uh, harassed in a workplace, now they publicly denounce that, uh, the, that kind and it is very active now. But on the other hand, the media, the role of the media. So we always uh, highlight that silence, uh, Silent is kind of violence. Mm -hmm. But in our media, there is not much voices are heard for the, that kind of sexual harassment or violence against women. So I'd like to ask to Jody, how about the role of media in that cases? So I'd like to get your advice for the role of the media. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Um, you know, I think I think that uh, I, I guess I'll answer on two levels. I mean, one is that literally, you know, writing about sexual harassment, writing about violence against women, uh, doing hardcore investigative work about kind of the problems that may be particular to women is an essential responsibility of of journalism today. And I think you know we had this kind of amazing thing happened. I mean, you know, uh, and it was Jody and Megan and other women at the New other people at the New York Times, as well as Ronan Farrow of the New Yorker, they won the, you know, journalism's highest prize, the, the Pulitzer for Public Service, um, for these set of reporting. And I think it, it is critical to just remember that. And I do think I think in the past, investigative reporting resources might not have been turned on these problems, right? This is, you know, decisions made largely by male editors in male-run institutions who might investigate corrupt politicians or um, companies and not necessarily something that is sort of seen as a woman's problem. I think that that is an important thing that happened and that needs to continue to happen and that's our responsibility. There's a, there's a broader thing, though, I think about uh, the media's role in kind of leveling society more generally, which has to do with its, its, our own version of kind of representation and the question of how do we tell stories? How can we elevate uh, women's stories and women's voices? Um, to me, it's almost more important in stories that really have nothing to do with women, um, but stories that are, are the sort of more mainstream. I mean, how many female experts get quoted in your average science story or um, political story or economic story. How do we, when I was uh, the bureau chief in Jerusalem, I realized how there was this whole kind of security industrial complex filled with former military generals who were like professional quote providers for journalists like me, and they were all men. And it was, you know, took a lot of work to make sure to, to elevate women's voices in that work. Um, and there's a number of media organizations and individuals who are kind of really affirmatively going after that now and trying to uh, have better representation in quotation, in subjects, in um, photographs and videos on, on news sites. And I think that that's an important part of the media responsibility also. Again, not just to unearth stories of women uh, at the center, but to really bring women from all professions and walks of life kind of into the conversation in a more prominent way. Yeah, we, we, we keep tables now inside the BBC of how many, how many women contributors we've had on the program that have nothing to do with women's issues. Mm. And well, at the what end are of women's issues too, like when, when you have a well, what a male editor would say are women's issues, <laughs> but, but human issues. I, I think that's also really important that when a woman writes a column, that it shouldn't always be about domestic issues because I think it just puts us in a very small box and the it women's issues can be everything. I don't I don't feel like we just need to write about childcare, although that is a very important issue. And we went to see a show at the Fringe the other night. And the sort of catch cry was, the revolution cannot happen without childcare. And I thought, <laughs> <laughs> that was great, because it's true. Um, the lady just there. It's very obvious that the ratio between men and women in this audience yeah. has radically changed. Yeah. Yeah. Since the last event. Since the last yeah. event. We in noticed fact, it. Also more years. empty chairs. <laughs> and there's four <laughs> amazing women sitting there that I wouldn't have missed listening to. Have you any reflections on what that's about? Or also the men in the audience might be able to say something. And well, what we can do something about it? 
Jodie, we were talking about this outside, so let's I start mean, with you. Um, look, I think if this conversation was happening a year ago, it might not have been on the schedule and there'd be fewer of you here. So I think we're in a better place now, um, a year on or a hundred years on than, I mean, and Todd, I'm sure has experience with this. As you said, you were doing this work and, and not getting calls back and now get much more attention from mm. men in power. I, I'm going to give people a little bit of a pass because it's the last session of the day and I think like the beer is flowing in the other tent, but um, <laughs> no, it's depressing. I'm not. It's depressing. I mean, why did more, you know, people, <laughs> there was a big packed crowd here to see two white guys talking about the UN and now we've got three women of color and one very old white woman. Yeah. Um, <laughs> That's why they left. <laughs> Holy shit. No, I don't know. It's depressing. It's depressing. Oh. Mark, are you here? Why? Where are you? Where's Mark was in the back before. What do you think? Yeah, uh, he's not even here. No, he was here. He was here. And he's, to be fair to Mark, he's been going in and out all the time. Yeah, yeah, he's, of course. he's holding okay. court out in yeah, the back. Yeah, but. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. Maybe, I'd love maybe to... we should just randomly ask a man to respond to that. Oh, yeah, there's one. Excellent. <laughs> there's one. <laughs> and admit if your wife made you come. <laughs> She's here. But I would like to say, as a man, I've enjoyed this. Come to another. Okay. Why, thank Brilliant. you, sir. <laughs> we were going we to offer cookies for anyone who came that we made ourselves, but they... No, but he has I, something to actually say. I also wanted to say that I worked in various um, areas, particularly uh, with regard to what you were saying about the nautical world. I worked in mining and I worked in construction. There were no women there yeah. at all. Yeah. At all. And um, it's quite a rough world. Yeah. And it's rough for men as well as it is for women. It's rough for sensitive people yeah, too. No, no, but I mean, you know, it's not... See. But <laughs> it's interesting that there are very, very few openings for, for women yeah. there. But... It's also, I mean, you know, this is a, an area where, where men also suffer, not because of sensitivity, because of, uh, you know, openings into the industry as well, some, some sort of industry that people naturally get into. Mm. They will be worried about competition from a whole quarter which they thought would never exist in their lifetimes. But that's, there's very good reason to get women into the construction industry. Absolutely. Yes, of course. Um, what I want to say, I, mean, so I suppose partly about what you're saying about um, there not being very men here, many men here, is that often men are completely uninterested in women talking about women's issues. Mm. I used to work for the Observer, and I was a foreign correspondent for the Observer. In fact, I was a war correspondent for the Observer, and I was very young at the time. And um, the Observer didn't know how to deal with that at all, and that's a liberal newspaper. And uh, they did call me off an investigative story on people trafficking to write a piece about the glass ceiling, which I wrote... And I filed on a sun Friday afternoon just before the Canary Wharf bomb went off. And what I did was I said in the piece, uh, sexism exists everywhere. You know, it's not just the Foreign Office, which was, we were talking about. I said, let's take the Observer. And I analysed the Observer staff <laughs> handbook. I bet they love that. Well, of all the executives, there was one female executive. The rest were all male. Um, I analysed what percentage of the staff had children. All the men were married with children. Very few of the women were married mm -hmm, with children. Mm -hmm. So I filed this piece and they ran it on the back page. Ooh, I don't know, 10 maybe. None of, all the women the following week said to me, amazing story, Charlotte, amazing story. None of the men had read it. Not one. Mm -hmm. And the other thing was that having filed this piece on the glass ceiling, having taken me off the uh, people trafficking story, the Canary Wharf one went off. And I was the only war correspondent in the office. So I was the only person who didn't mind being bombed. So they had to send me to Canary Wharf. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, so I didn't really want to ask a question, except I wanted to say that the problem is that within the power structures of newspapers is that they're so sordid sexist that really, thank, well done for getting to the top. Yeah. It's bloody <laughs> difficult, and particularly if you're interested in serious things. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much for sharing that. Well done. That, I mean, I think... Thank you. I, I, I do think this goes back to the surgeon's question, too, about... Um, inspiring women to kind of join things. I, th I really think one of the lessons of my generation for the next generation is really is about, you know, is about being honest about what it's like. I mean, there, so, you know, there's one thing about making sure that women can become more correspondents as, as I was as well. Um, there's most of my peers uh, chose not to be war correspondents. Um, and it was, uh, you know, I 
am, I would have been a better uh, parent if I had not gone to Jerusalem. Uh, that was not, you know, the highlight of my parenting life was working all the time um, in that job. So I think it's really complicated when you talk about how do we inspire young women to go into these professions that are so hard. I mean, they're hard. Mm -hmm. And this this situation with the work-life balance like not being fixed, um, it's real. And I think, I, I don't know, I think one of, the, one of the signs of progress is when people really are free to choose all kinds of different things. And I do think actually, Maybe the best thing that's going to happen for women in terms of work-life balance is going to be the um, changing situation in terms of sexuality mm -hmm. and um, and identity. And so the more that couple, that being a couple is not a you know a, a heterosexual default, may I probably do more for the changes in that in in really in society than than kind of any change in the workplace is going to do. But anyway, I think I just think it's like it's really really complicated. Uh, is kind of my big takeaway, which is not that helpful it's for a activism. But um, I think I do think that um, I think that people who are ten years uh, older than me, I don't know if any of them are on the stage. Um, <laughs> or 15, were afraid to say that. They were afraid to say, I mean, one of my mentors, yeah. Joyce Pernick, who um, was the Metro editor of the New York Times who hired me, um, made a speech at, uh, at Barnard at the graduation where she basically said women can't have it all and that one of the reasons she had become Metro editor of the New York Times was because she didn't have kids. And people went crazy, especially the women who worked for her who had kids. And I don't blame them for going crazy but she wasn't lying, yeah, no, <laughs> you know? Important. And um, I think it's important to really yeah. open this up and talk about all the mm -hmm. peels of the onion. Yeah. Absolutely. Know, going from one airport to another and in the end and most of the women I know who are foreign correspondents had terrible problems conceiving as well because you're on adrenaline all the time. Yeah. I have friends who had you know, miscarriages in the Gaza Strip, you know, miscarriages in <laughs> Afghanistan. I'm like, oh, maybe I should so stop now. I, know? I, I will say a couple of just inspiring little anecdotes. First of all, the, I covered two wars in Gaza. And the first one in 2012, we noticed on the first night when one of us was calling our kids, calling home, that we were a table of um, six, six women, and most of us were mothers, uh, all from a bunch of different outlets. And that was kind of a, a great moment. And then there was another moment. I've, I have um, twins, a boy and a girl. And... Um, while we were in Jerusalem one Saturday morning, we were sitting around, and I was trying to teach them how to sweep the floor, <laughs> um, which I'm not particularly good at either. But um, and they were maybe seven, six, seven. And my son said, uh, "It's really important for me to learn because the mommies have big jobs and the daddies clean up the house." <laughs> That's very good. And I thought that was great. <laughs> So, so I, I, I will share a, a really rather depressing anecdote. <laughs> I, I went for a job uh, which I didn't hear about for quite some time. And inside the BBC, if you get the job, you hear on the day. And weeks later, I got a call and uh, was told that I had by far done the best interview and they would like to offer me the job. And when could I start? And I said, I don't know if you've noticed, but I'm seven and a half months pregnant. <laughs> And he said, oh, shit, we thought you were fat. <laughs> Without a breath. He didn't even take a breath. So, you know, there we go. Wow. Uh, you wanted to say something. See, now yeah. you can sue him for saying Yeah, that. now I could. <laughs> Retrospectively, I'm going to take action. Razo, through you, could I say to the man who said he enjoyed what he'd heard, let's hope he actually actions on what he's heard. <laughs> oh... Yay! <laughs> more questions. Well, then it doesn't count that he came. <laughs> <laughs> okay, any more questions? Lady in the front. J just wait until you get the microphone, please, so everyone can hear. Thank you. We always hear so much about how difficult it is to manage ourselves in the workplace, and I wondered how it was for the man who had worked primarily in an all-male profession. How did you manage to exist without flirting? <laughs> I know I'm who making, said he didn't flirt I with the other I'm men? I know I'm making an yeah, assumption he saying flirt. that, but... And the same with women. I mean, how, how would we all manage and work without... I mean, you know, is it a problem? I mean, you know, we're trying to say, can, we, can men not manage in the workplace without having this other relationship with women? 
That's all I'm wondering. I, I haven't heard an answer. No. Okay. <laughs> and I don't flirt with my co workers and the uh, um, producing Syrian uh, pro the women by the advice. So, and but you didn't yeah. miss it. You managed it to, to actually hold <laughs> down a job <laughs> without. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is, it's fun, but I do, I do think it's not just about like this flirting issue, yeah. right? It really is about the tenor of meetings and the way assignments are made and yeah. just kind of the style yeah. that is, there are gender And women aspects. being shut down all the time, yeah. you know, not having their voices heard inside right, a meeting. Right, attribution issues. Yeah. I mean, there's just yeah. a lot of issues yeah. about yeah. gender in the workplace. Madeline, did you want to say something? I'm going to take one final question, Eldridge, at just the back. Just going back to women working in the construction industry, and you mentioned that it's a tough industry, as if to suggest that women can't work in a tough industry and there wasn't an outcry from the audience when you said that. I would like to, me. to mention that working at sea is also a tough lifestyle. It's a physical lifestyle. It's something that challenges you in many ways and women are absolutely capable mm -hmm. of existing in, in that environment. So just to imagine that it's tough doesn't mean that it excludes women. No, that's good. Go ahead. <laughs> Final um, question. Yeah, well, n well, not really a question. Well, just to say I flirt all the time anyway, so <laughs> at work, yeah, that's fine. But what I wanted to say was that um, the question about, uh, the, it's empty now and it was full in the previous one, but let's not also forget that that was an uh, uh, interview with a woman that was actually packed. But in the <laughs> same tone, again, that's the only interview where we saw her being asked to explicitly talk yeah. about her sexual life. Yeah. You know, there were a lot yeah. of men here, nobody asked once about that. Yeah? You should totally so, ask Jeffrey Feldman tomorrow about his sex life. Yeah, it's yeah. gonna be the first question. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's what everyone wants to yeah, know. Yeah, now I've warmed him up and we had the yeah. chat earlier. Yeah, it's exactly okay. what's gonna happen. I, I hate being interrupted <laughs> by these self. very old women. But Jody, you know, you can, you can, you can go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, they can say but that, you can't. <laughs> <laughs> That's not how this works. Thank you. At, at all. No. <laughs> Eldridge is also of my generation, I believe. <laughs> okay. Yes, I was also born in the 30s. But listen, uh, just the last thing to Are say. Are you still speaking? Sorry. Yes, I, I am. I am. <laughs> uh, is that, um, again, and maybe I grew up with my sisters, so it has an impact on me in the sense that a lot of them are older than me. And they could do all the things I could do. They could do it before me. They could beat me up when we fought. So I always understood the strength in women and that they could do anything I could do. So it was never a case of you have to uh, uh, undermine this year. But this is still something that even when we work today, I know the value of it and always try to bring women into what we're doing and, and work as equal partners, uh, not you know, in, in anything different. But there are structural things in the workplace, and you talked about salaries and things like this, that undermine even the little bit of effort you try to make in terms of trying to have any equality. And it's also the work structure, in terms of, uh, you talked about having the time, the flexibility, maternity leave, paternity leave. These structures need to be also be in introduced into the workplace mm -hmm. in order to make it possible. Uh, for, for men, because men are also, you know, it's not always fun to be macho, eh? It's also a tough, horrible, isolated oh, act as well. <laughs> and they also need to be able to be brought out of that. And that you need to have with, with changing the structure. Well, we'll that was to, all we'll I wanted to, to say. We'll have to talk to Mark There's about having that as, that, a, yeah. as another session for men. Um, <laughs> I, I am that, going maybe to. That session's going on. Yeah, and that's where, maybe all, the that's men where are. they all are. <laughs> it's, with the beer, it's in the beer tent. It's in the beer tent. Anyway, so we have to wrap up now. So um, I am just going to say thank you very much to Madeline and to Talat and to Jody. Thank you, Razia. Thank you very much. And before you all put your yeah. jackets on and go, oh, I'd like okay. to leave you with a quote that I read today, and it really struck me. It's by the very great novelist, Ursula K. Le Guin, who died very recently. And she said, we are volcanoes. When we women offer our experience as our truth, as human truth, all the maps change. There are new mountains. Thank you very much for coming. I hope you enjoyed your day and come back again tomorrow. <laughs>